Great. Everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. If you notice, they've turned the blowers on in the room, so it's not so hot anymore. Earlier, I thought that they should change the name from machine house to, to bathhouse because it was like a sauna in here. But thanks for coming today. My name is Gary Deuce-Babic, and I work for Rackspace, um, the cloud metrics team. And we're building an API so that we have a common system in-house for dealing and managing time series metrics that come from our cloud monitoring system. Before that, I worked on the cloud monitoring team and uh, did different things for that team, and our team spun out of that. So as I said, our primary job is to manage the metrics that come out of that system. We're currently ingesting data that comes from thousands of nodes, most of them inside Rackspace, but we're starting to get more data coming from outside Rackspace. And once it's an API, we'll be getting data from all over the place. And so that's pretty exciting. Blue Flood is a distributed system that we created to manage that time series data. Blue Flood will ingest it. We'll roll it up so that the data is easier to manage. And it will then make it available for query. Blue Flood was optimized and designed to do two things really well. One is ingest data quite quickly. And the other thing is to make it available for reads very quickly with the idea that it's going to be used to generate graphs. And so it, it works best when you're retrieving roughly between 300 to 400 data points at a time. Performance is a little bit slower once you get beyond that. But we've, we've optimized the read path for a sweet spot of about 300 to 400 data points. Blue Flood was introduced last year at Berlin Buzzwords, and we've been busy making it better software since then. You've probably come here to hear about some of the new features that we've added as part of Blue Flood version 2, and I promise you that I'm going to talk about those features, but there's a really easy way for you to get at that information, and that's just to take a look at our changes file and look for all the awesome stuff that, that we've added. What I really want to spend time talking about today are some of the things that we've learned as we've added those features because I think we have some interesting things to share about building distributed systems, about managing time series data, and about the time series space or set of software that we see at open source and, and commercial providers in general. We've, we've, we've learned a lot. So I think this will plan to you, what, I think this information will apply to you whether you plan on using Blue Flood or not. At least I hope so. So in short, I'd like to focus on what comes next. OK, so I'm going to proceed along with this basic outline. I'm first going to talk about the current state of Blue Flood, including the new features that we've added since we've released the source. Uh, we've made a lot of improvements, making it better. Then I'm going to spend some time talking about the, I guess, the, the state of affairs with metric software and some observations that we've made. And then I'm going to make an invitation to all of you. There are things that you can do to help Blue Flood, to help some of the other projects. And I, I want to make some specific invitations and then finish by setting, setting some goals for us all, because I think that we're just getting started and there's a wonderful place that we can hopefully end up at someday. So we decided to release Blue Flood in March of last year. We thought it would be a quick process, maybe take us a month. It ended up taking us almost five months. We've been working really hard since then to, to make it better. That was a big learning process for us because we, we thought that it would be just a simple act of moving code from one repository to another. But if you've ever done that, you know that that's not the case. There's problems with dependencies. There's coupling that you didn't think about. There's assumptions that you've made in the code that make it difficult. And so that process ended up taking us quite a bit longer. We realized that, quite simply, it would have been better for us to start as an open source software for two main reasons. One, this would have given a chance for the community around the software to start up organically or naturally, and it would be more, more active as the project matured. And we would have had our dependencies and coupling and, and, and relations correct from the beginning. So in, in case you might be thinking about open sourcing some software, some projects that you're working on, those are some things to consider. Uh, time, it takes longer, and ways that you can, you can get the community growing. The process of producing open source software is quite a bit different than producing closed source software. Specifically, every mistake or good thing that you do is quite visible and transparent to others. When we had production issues, well, we had to sometimes make quick uh, code changes, uh, GitHub, uh, GitHub reviews and pull requests, 
And it was happening you know, in front of everybody, so they got to see some of the drama that we might be having in our own production cluster. But that's a good thing. I think transparency in open source projects is very important. Last year, we were ingesting about 15,000 uh, metric points per second, and this was as much data as our production environment could put in. We, were, we, were, we didn't have time to write proper load testing tools, and so we would just send as much data as we could gather into our system, and then that's how much we were doing last year. This year, we've roughly doubled that. We're doing about 30,000 points, and we see bursts up to 40,000 points a second. As far as huge distributed systems go, this is, this is not much. But as we've monitored the, the servers and the processes, we know that there's room for a lot more growth, and we expect it to be able to handle more. But still, we're limited by how fast cloud monitoring can send data into our system. In this time, we've also made the switch from physical hardware to virtual hardware. And so really, we're actually doing more with less. This gives us an elastic capability that we did not have before. And we think it's important because as an open source project, we want to be using our software the way we expect other people to be using software as well. And we don't expect people to provision massive clusters of you know, 100 uh, real live pieces of hardware. We expect people to use Amazon Web Services or, or Rackspace cloud servers or, or any virtual system. And so that's important. We've tested higher loads, but they haven't been sustained tests. But we feel confident that once we, once we get the, the time and the resources to do sustained tests, that we'll be happy with the ingestion performance. We've also spent quite a bit of time expanding the capabilities within Blue Flood. There are two big features that lay the groundwork for a lot of future improvement as far as what Blue Flood is capable of doing. And enabling Blue Flood to work better with external systems. And those are two things that we think are going to be Im important moving on. When Blue Flood was first released, we, we basically handled only simple gauges. Now, a gauge is just a snapshot of, da of data at a point in time. And then that data would then, those gauges would then get rolled up. We would do a little bit of analysis on them, compute the minimum, the maximum, the average, uh, standard deviation, and, and a few other things. We knew from the beginning that we were going to want to integrate Blue Flood with other tools and other kinds of data. So we kind of planned ahead as far as how we serialize the data in the database, knowing that these other data types are going to come along. Also, we had internal customers who were asking for these things, and so we knew that it was going to be important. We expected to, to put the work in to do it, to do this. And so we've added the capabilities for counters, timers, and sets. And as I said, this gives us some, inflex some flexibility on the kind of data that we can ingest and lays the groundwork some, for some important integrations and features that we're going to be able to do in the future. Some other things that we've done is we've added integration points in Blue Flood that allow us to get data out of our system in bulk. Specifically, we've added implementations that allow you to export rollups as they happen in real time to Kafka queues as well as export rollups as they happen into long-term storage, like cloud files or S3, things like that. The main purpose of doing this was, is to allow you to do bulk operations on your data offline from your cluster. We realized that, that this is an important use case, and we wanted to be able to service it just for ourselves, which is why we implemented it, but also for people who might be thinking about using Blue Flood in their own systems. When Blue Flood was first released, there was only a primitive kind of indexing before. Basically, the only question we could answer was, what are all of my metrics you know, for a given tenant or user? And it would return a list of metrics. And so that was the only kind of index that we had at that point. We knew that we wanted to be able to answer more difficult questions. We wanted to be able to tag metrics. We wanted to be able to associate key value metadata with metrics. And so we knew that we were going to have to have either some kind of index or some kind of indexing API to do this. And so we specified an interface in our code and created one concrete implementation that uses Elasticsearch. We, we've been pretty excited with the, the thought of using other, index, other indexes as well. And we've implemented one, but there are potentials to, to implement a few others. F from the beginning, we knew that we wanted to have very granular access to metric data. So what that means is we knew that we wanted to mainly look up metrics by their key name, one metric at a time, not groups of metrics. And so there was, there was nothing built in to group metrics together. Indexing will allow you to do this because you can associate a certain tag with a set of metrics and then eventually be able to query Blue Flood 
using that tag to return a set of metrics back over space and time. Also, the same thing goes for querying with, with key value metadata as well. So there's two parts to this interface. One is the, the part that's currently implemented is just how we index the metrics when they get ingested. And the other part's really unimplemented. It's the how we search for those. And so it's kind of a, a moving target. The main reason we're moving slow on this is we really want to avoid adding extra dependencies to Blue Flood. Uh, adding extra dependencies will complicate the process that, we use to, that you go through to install and set up. And we want to make it as, as simple as possible. So as much functionality that we can bring into Blue Flood, we will. But for things like this, we realize we're going to have to have e interfaces into external systems. We've also increased the performance of Blue Flood. Previously, as I said before, we, it was important for us to be able to address metrics individually. And so the way you got a metric was one call, and you got one metric. The way you inserted a metric was one call, and you inserted one metric at a time. So if you had 1,000 metrics, well, you've got to do 1,000 different database operations. This doesn't scale well, especially with Cassandra, which is what we are using for our backend database. The, the overhead of creating a network round trip, talking to Cassandra was just a little too much, and it was causing us a lot of performance degradation. And so we reduced this, this bottleneck by just taking it out and introducing batch operations to both our ingest and roll-up pipelines. And this overnight increased our throughput and decreased the mean time to create a roll-up. So it gave us additional, cap well, it did not give us additional capability, but it made the system a lot more efficient. I think we are going to be able to improve this more as we start experiencing, as we start experimenting with the Cassandra native protocol, which we still, we still haven't done. Cassandra has changed a lot in the last two years, which is how long we've been building this software. Specifically, you've probably observed that they've been moving more towards using CQL for data access and distancing themselves or, or encouraging people to stop using Thrift. At the same time, they've also, also been rapidly deprecating old versions of CQL. And so your, your best bet is to stay on the cutting edge of Cassandra and not get behind, because once you get behind, it becomes very difficult to move forward and get caught up. Well, at Blue, on the Blue Flood team, we happen to be very early adopters of CQL. When we first, uh, when we first released the code, we were using uh, Cassandra 1.0 with a CQL 2. And as you may or may not know, the difference between CQL2 and CQL3 are huge, not just uh, semantically, but syntactically as well. There were some big differences there. This made it hard for us to, to start taking advantage of the features in newer versions of Cassandra. And so we found that we had to swap out that database layer with a different one. We ended up using uh, Astyanx, which is a client library provided by Netflix that still uses Thrift. So we haven't been able to take full advantage of CQL version 3 yet, but we, we definitely want to get to that point. And it's allowed us to, to benefit from a lot of the new features that we see happening in Cassandra. Specifically, the, the, the favorite one that, that I've been most appreciative of is the way that Cassandra, I believe, is 1.2, allows you to put certain column families on different mount points. So for instance, we have a full resolution a metrics column family that gets a lot of writes, that gets a lot of reads. And so we moved that to SSD, was able to benefit from the performance improvements. But meanwhile, we're able to keep all of our other column families, which don't receive as much traffic, on spinning disks. So that was, it's, it saved us some money. We were happy about that. When we first released Blue Flood, we did it without any API. We used Thrift internally to access the data, and we didn't want to share that interface with the public because, quite frankly, it was a little embarrassing. It, it contained some internals into our cloud monitoring infrastructure that would have looked confusing to anybody looking at it from the outside. And so we rationalized to ourselves that if we just made it easy for other people to implement APIs on top of Blue Flood, that they would do it. But this turned out to be a bad assumption for us, and so it was a lesson that we learned. People prefer to have self-contained systems. If, if they're going to install it, they want an API to access it, not have to create an API themselves. And so we spent some time, we spent some time and created HTTP endpoints. We have uh, two reference endpoints right now. You still have the ability to put in your own API endpoint, but we have 
two HTTP endpoints that you can use. One is uh, synchronous, that uses a traditional thread per connection model, and the other is asynchronous, which you can use for, to exploit concurrency. Along those same lines, we've improved the experience for multi-tenant customers. Specifically, we knew that we would have one huge customer, which is Rackspace Cloud Monitoring, who would be sending data in for lots of other tenants. And we still had to respect that each of those tenants were different. Uh, they may have different uh, retention constraints. They may have vastly different kinds of data that they send in. And we, we made that experience a lot better. The controls that we've exposed for that will happen at the, at the proxy layer, which we encourage people to use if they're going to be sending data into Blue Flood. We've also simplified how we manage the metadata that you can associate with a metric. As I, as I talked about before, we are, this, is, this happens via the search interface that we're adding. Previously, we relied on this clunky internal API. This, I'm sorry, this clunky internal interface that you would have to implement that would fetch metric metadata out of uh, your external system. We didn't support bringing it in with the metrics. But we decided we're going to make it simple so that you can just send in all the metadata with your metrics. We'll handle it, and things will be just fine. So we've simplified that problem and ended up removing a lot of code, making things easier to install. We've added lots of other features, too. But our team is kind of small. We have only three engineers and one operations person who, while we develop Blue Flood for a lot of our time, we're also tasked with managing a production cluster of Blue Flood and Cassandra and making sure that we have good uptime there. And so we haven't had quite the resources or the time to develop, to develop the community of Blue Flood. It's, it's an open source project, and open source projects thrive when there's a community. And we realize that this is going to take time, and this is, going to, this is going to take effort. And this is something that, as engineers, we are not really good at. I, this, is a, this is, I think, a perennial problem with, with open source software and with engineers. Growing a community is, is, a, hard things, is a hard thing. So the fact that, rem the fact that remains is Bluevled is still a young project. There are lots of problems that come with being such a, a young and immature project. This is really easy to illustrate. This is a picture of me. It was taken, uh, I don't know, two years ago. Obviously, I'm an adult. I'm dressed pretty sharply. Normally, I walk around in a t-shirt and a pair of shorts, but I, I look sharp in this picture. It's because I know who I am, I know what I want to do, and I know how to do it because I have experience. Now, this is also a picture of me. It's taken, it's okay to laugh, it's okay, go ahead, get it out. It's taken when I was 12 years old. I was not very experienced. I was definitely not confident. And you're probably questioning my taste. Um, I've changed a lot over time. I went through an awkward phase, and I imagine a lot of you in here went through an awkward, awkward phase as well. Because trust me, you all weren't as cool as you are now. This is the way it works. Software is the, I was immature. Software is, is the same way. Software has to be given a chance to grow up too. Think about some of the tools, some of the software that you've been using for a long time. Was it always as good as it is now? Probably not. Hopefully it's, it's changed and, and gotten better over time. Some of the systems that I have a lot of experience with, one of them is, is Cassandra. I first became involved with Cassandra uh, between four and five years ago. And at the time, Cassandra didn't have indexes. Cassandra didn't have caches, no in-memory caches. Cassandra did not have a query language. And if you wanted to change the schema of your Cassandra cluster, you had to edit an XML file and then do a rolling restart of your whole cluster. So if you were to take a look at, at Cassandra today and it was missing those four, th four things, you would think to yourself, my goodness, what a primitive tool. I cannot use this stuff. The fact is that software evolves and becomes better over time as it matures. So we end up demanding more of it and relying on it more. Well, how mature is Blue Flood? I created a handy graph, and at the left-hand side, we have the 12-year-old me, and at the other side, we have the very handsome adult me. Blue Flood, I think, is right about here. We're, f we're firmly on the immature side of software development. Good thing? Bad thing? The biggest thing is that you definitely have an opportunity to help. 
The code base for Blue Flood is relatively small. We've taken some time to make it understandable. We've divided it up into modules that should be easy to understand independently. And the, the core code base probably is, is a little bit uh, complicated, but the core contributors are active on IRC, we're active on our mailing list, we are willing and, 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 and happy to help out whenever we can. There's a lot of potential, I think, to turn the corner a little bit in the metrics ecosystem in general. Blue Flood is only part of a larger group of software. We see from the open source world um, Kairos DB, we see OpenTSDB, and on the commercial side, we have some API providers like Librato, like TempoDB, and there are others. The, the whole environment is, is young. They're just getting started. If you look at where the metrics uh, scene was 12 months ago versus what it is now, you'll see a lot of growth. And I expect continuing on for the next 12 months, 24 months, things are going to be looking completely different. Our software is advancing. We're getting better quickly because the software is so immature. I think it's really hard to predict the future. There's a simple illustration for this. I don't know when this was drawn, but obviously the illustrator got a few things right and a few things wrong. He knew that we'd be talking on devices, but he didn't know how good the future would really be. We're doing that right now on things like this. So from that perspective, the future is way better than he envisioned it. On the other hand, we're still not flying around in our awesome, awesome private airplanes. So obviously, the future is not as good as, as he expected it. I think that we can get to a point with our metric software, and not talking just about Blue Flood, I'm talking about the open source systems, the external API providers, where we can be ingesting a million points per second per node. That's currently probably an order of magnitude different from, from what any system is, is capable of now. The databases that we use can handle that, and so I don't think there's any reason that the API, APIs or any of the open source software can't get to that point as well. So I think that this is a goal that we could shoot for. We're probably not very far from getting there. There are some technical challenges. I think there are some social challenges as well. I think that we need to start thinking together more. It's, um, we see a lot of, of different projects coming along to solve very specific problems or general problems, but too much work in this space goes on independently. We need to put our heads together. All it's going to take, I think, are a few champions in each project or champions at a few different communities who are willing to communicate and to collaborate and make this a better space in general. And I think that we could all benefit when our, when our ideas start mixing together. There are some things, believe it or not, that you can do right now to help get us there. First off, help us with our glaring lack of documentation. This has always been a problem with open source software. Some projects do it well, others I'd say most do it very poorly. Better documentation will enable a whole bunch of other improvements. There's going to be better adoption because people are going to understand it when they have good references to go to. It's going to help with the community because it's going to require people to work on the, work on the documentation. When people talk, people solve problems. It's going to help with the installation and configuration of the software. Anyone here use Graphite? Y'all, what? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Easy or hard to set up and get going? Be honest, there we go, okay. There might have been a thumbs up, I don't know. I hope there are no graphite people, in, like workers in here, but it's still good software. It's the best at what it does. I would also invite you to give Blue Flood a try. I have a personal barometer for software, and that is if I can install it and get it running in 10 minutes, I'll continue to give it a try. But if not, I'm gonna walk away until I can do that. Blue Flood may or may not be that kind of software for you. We've taken some time to try and, and create a 10-minute guide that will get you there. But if it doesn't and you walk away from Blue Flood, that's fine. But I would ask for you to let us know. Let us know where the pain points were for you so that we can make it better for the next person. That would, be, that would help us, even if you don't end up using it. Our goal is to make people happy and make good software for them. So give Blue Flood a try. Another thing you can do is contribute code. As I said before, it's modular, it should be simple to understand, and we want to help you. We will make this happen if you want to, to use Blue Flood. You can also make the tooling around Blue Flood better. We haven't had the resources to devote a lot of time into this. Specifically, one thing that I'd like to see is a load testing suite. Um, 
This will help us to know where blue flood eventually falls, falls over. And we expect that there is a place where it will, will fall over. If you're good at making system packages for different operating systems, help us out with that. Um, the installation and configuration is something that we know that our team won't get to for a long time. We currently use Chef to, to, to deploy and, and bundle Blue Flood, and we're happy with that. But I think that would help with the 10-minute test if you were able just to app get install Blue Flood and, and, and be on your way. We could also use help with integrating Blue Flood with, with other tools and softwares. Um, Example, if, if any of you program use Java and you use Code Hail metrics, well, we could write an output uh, a reporter that would get your data from Code Hail metrics into, into Blue Flood. To demonstrate how easy or maybe how hard it is to get Blue Flood uh, integrated with some other software, I just want to show you a few things. We'll see how easy this is. This is a, a Graphite web server that, uh, can everyone see that? That is talking directly to Blue Flood. There is no carbon daemon. There is no whisper database. All there is is graphite web that's been slightly modified, talking directly to Blue Flood. And this makes it so that you can do some really cool things. So for example, in the green line here, I'm charting the temperature in San Antonio, Texas, where I am from. And in the blue line here, I've been charting the weather in Berlin, where I am at now. This is just scraped off the internet from a, a public API. As you can see, the temperatures here are in Fahrenheit, which I'm told only Americans use. At least we drive on the right side of the road, right? Any, anyone from England in here? Yeah. <laughs> Fix that. OK, so, this, so the fact that we're using Graphite Web lets us take advantage of a lot of the features of Graphite Web. Specifically, I can, call the, uh, I can convert this, these uh, Fahrenheits into Celsius is fairly easy. There's an offset function, and I'm going to say take away 32 degrees, and then I'm going to say scale it by about that much, which is 5 ninths. And all of a sudden, the Berlin temperature disappears. I forgot a parenthesis. As you can tell, I'm an excellent programmer. OK. And so there you see it, and I'll do the same thing to San Antonio. We call this copy pasta. Sometimes it works, sometimes it, uh, you don't know what you're copying or pasting. And there we go. So now we have the same graph in Fahrenheit. I have some other graphs in here that just show some, some different things. This, uh, this, this graph here shows how much warmer it is in San Antonio than Berlin. So 20 degrees Fahrenheit during some points of the day. I come from a hot place, people. Um, so that's a demo. The, the code that I used to have a Graphite Web talk to Blue Flood is only about 150 lines, and it could use some improvement, but it's just a demonstration at this, this point. Some other, some other integrations that we've done are with StatsD. Um, StatsD is a JavaScript application written in using the Node.js framework, and it gives you a common ingestion point that then lets you fan your data out. There's support for different backends, and we went ahead and created a Blue Flood backend. And this is nice because it gives you the ability to try Blue Flood without changing your whole metrics pipeline. All you do is add the configuration for Blue Flood, and you should be off, off and going, assuming we don't change our API endpoints or anything like that. I've already demonstrated how we, how we do that with, with Graphite. So at some point, we're going to know that we have succeeded. And this is going to be when there's a community, and not just a community around Blue Flood, but a better and healthier and vibrant community around the metric space in general. Specifically, the software is going to be easy to set up. The technology is just going to be better because it will have matured. It will have improved. It's going to become super reliable. It's going to be something that we think about, but something that we don't worry about. There will be less dependencies because the software will be capable of, of doing more things. There are some things, I think, that will get in the way of us getting there. What I see happening is, is open source systems are starting to be bottlenecked by their databases. Think about it. Each of the time series, uh, open source time series systems uses a database to actually store the time series data. There's some overhead there just getting the data into a separate data system. We've reached the point with Cloud Metrics that Cassandra is our biggest bottleneck. And so there's several different ways that, that this could be solved in the future. 
But this goes to speak of the immaturity of the whole, whole metric scene in general. This is almost a benefit, though, because the fact that, this, that, the, that the scene is so immature means that we're going to be able to improve it quickly. That's great. Many of the problems that we have in the metrics scene are not technical. They're problems that can be solved with a better community, with people working together. So where do we go from here? When you think about it, metric systems like Blue Flood or Kairos or OpenTSDB are just a means to an end. You use them either for getting pretty graphs or you use them for feeding Hadoop clusters that you do different kinds of intelligence and analysis with. And if you, you've ever used these systems, you know that we're just scratching the tip when it comes to efficiency. Hadoop is a general solution, and it's not necessarily very efficient. In English, we have a figure of speech that when your only tool is a hammer, everything that needs to be fixed looks like a nail. Likewise, I've heard it said of Hadoop that when all you have is a Hadoop cluster, everything looks like a MapReduce job. We've got to be smarter with how we do analytics on our data. We've waited years for our data stores to get here, and now they're finally here. We can't squander this opportunity to, to make some awesome systems. There's lots of work to do. All you have to do is start pitching in, writing code, working on documentations. It doesn't have to be this project. It can be any project. We're all going to benefit when we start getting better. If we execute well enough, we're going to be riding around in those freaking airplanes, driving around, we'll be talking on our phones. It's going to be an awesome, awesome place. I think in the future, there's a native distributed time series data store. There's lots of optimizations that you can do when you know that your data is going to be append only, when you know that it's going to be arriving mostly in order, and when you know that most of it's going to be expiring all at once. With my experience with Cassandra, I happen to be a committer, I know that a lot of operations would be a lot simpler if you knew that you were only going to be dealing with range queries and you could collect tombstones in bulk. Multi-tenant systems will be a little bit harder, but we'll, we'll tackle that problem. What if Kairos, OpenS, TSDB, and all those other databases and API providers adopted a common API? It would help the community because there wouldn't be so much problems with switching between different vendors or implementations, and we would all benefit from speaking the same language. Those are two things that I would love to see that I think we should, we should definitely shoot for. The time series community, the time series database community needs to start working together, sharing our success stories, deduplicating our own effort. We solve the same problems multiple times. Thank you for your time. I wanted to point out just a few other presentations. Eric Evans is going to give a time series database presentation tomorrow. And if you're interested in data modeling on Cassandra, I'm sure they're going to talk about time series data. That's going to happen tomorrow afternoon as well. But uh, thanks for your time, everybody. I think we might have a minute or two for questions. In dealing with time series data, particularly with metrics, you showed a lot of numbers which show throughput. And your targeted numbers with throughput, what are the latencies you're targeting at with those throughputs? On our, our write latencies are obviously lower. We want to, to keep things with underneath, underneath five seconds because anything bigger than that is going to be just unacceptable. Reads we can tolerate a little bit more because we know that we're reading a finite number of data points. I, don't, I can't recall the numbers off the top of my head what performance our Cassandra cluster is doing now, but it's within acceptable parameters for us and the people who consume our graphs because we would hear complaints from them. And is there an expectation to have real-time graphs coming in? Uh, like, what's real time for you? Five seconds, you said, is right. So real time must be more than that. So what's your, what's your acceptable limit for real time? I, I would say it, it depends on how many, how many graphs you're pulling data in from. But if, if you can get one graph in less than half a second or even faster, that's probably fine. Um, if you've used Graphite, you realize once you get a certain amount of data and you have 15 or 20 graphs, it, 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 it crawls. This is one of the things that Blue Flood's actually good at and why we, we think that it's going to be fun to have it talking directly or to have Graphite talking directly to it. Uh, also, like one more thing. How close are you guys with the OpenStack teams? And is there an integration point you're looking for in the future? So OpenStack has a Solometer API, and they're mostly focused on dealing with events and not necessarily time series data. And so we've, we, we're aware of what they're doing and we're monitoring what they're doing. And if there's ever a way to... Uh, either put the projects together or to make sure we support their API, we'll end up doing that. <clears throat> um, the
the first part is I have to say I don't know much about your blue flat, but we are using Kairos DB, so how do you distinct yourself except, for example, multi-tenancy in terms of storage efficiency and speed? So if, if I recall Kairos DB, there is a single column family for metrics data. <clears throat> We split rollups up into their own column families. And so that's one key difference is, is the data store. Um, are you referring to open, ST, open TSDB or Kairos? I'm sorry. OK. Kairos at first only supported uh, HBase, if I remember correctly. And, and we, we've always used Cassandra. And so it was important for us to be able to use Cassandra. And so that's one reason we kind of didn't, didn't uh, start working with them earlier on. But I know that, I know that they support Cassandra now, though. That's about it. I mean, that's uh, it's as about as familiar as I can can go off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Great. Thanks for your time, everybody. <laughs>